14, probably one of the most preached on chapters in the Bible. Not just in the book of John, but probably in the Bible. As you know, uh, last week we discussed the Passover meal where Jesus was trying to make a point to his men and women as well. When I say men, I mean that whole group that was there. And that was that this is not a game, this is not a joke, this is real, and it's happening. There is a God, and He is my Father, and I am His Son, and He has sent me <clears throat> to redeem the world. And if I, being the Lord God, or the Son of the Lord God Almighty, can wash your feet, can you not at least try to wash one another's feet? figurative example of loving one another. And uh, I think the most misunderstood concept in Christianity in the mind of the unbeliever is that if, if there is a God, and most of them will say no because they don't want to be held accountable to him, if there is a God, well, it's too late for me, he already hates me, and there's no chance for me being saved. So it's just easier not to believe in a God than to believe in a retributive God or a God that's going to bring all hell upon me, so to speak. And that's where the world is. So when you come talking about Jesus Christ, most of them say, oh, that's too late for me. You know, I'm 68 years old, and if you had any idea of what I've done, even country singers sing about it. You know, God says, oh, I can't stand before the Lord because I've been this and that and everything else. And, you know, nothing could be farther from the truth than that statement. John Haley, I can't go to church. Why? Because the roof will fall in. John, we've had bigger sinners than you. Now, he's a good one, <laughs> but we've had bigger ones than you. The roof has not fallen in. We've had a lot of guys come through this little church, and it's got some severe cracks in it. True, but it has not fallen in. Well, you know, that kind of mentality is wholly, completely, in my opinion, within the mind of man. It has no place in God's kingdom. God says, if anyone comes to me, they will no way be thrown out, pushed aside, or cast out. Anyone comes to me. Throughout the Old Testament, where God's smashing and crashing and burning and locusts and all this other stuff, he says, if anybody returns to me, I will return to them. He says that about 300 and something times. If anyone wants to come to me, I will come back to them. And as far as the east is from the west, so shall their sins be from me. And the best the verse of the whole Bible, I will remember them no longer. You know that old phrase we have, that adage that says you got to learn to forgive and forget? The problem with, with humans is we can forgive if we're noble enough, but we never forget. You see what I'm saying? And because we can't forget, we destroy any chance of restoration, true restoration with relationship. What's past is past. And there's nothing you can do to redeem the past, but you can redeem the present. And you're not given the future. So this is what we got right now. Why would you waste day after day after day after day? And one day becomes two, two becomes seven, seven becomes a month, two months, three months, 10 years, 20 years slip by and you haven't talked to so-and-so or you know, best friend, family members hate each other for their whole life. And you go through this and you ask yourself, why? Nowhere in Scripture does God advocate that kind of behavior. He says, forgive and forget. Forgive and forget. If you return to me, says the Lord, I will return to you. And as far as the east is from the west, I love that. So will your sins be away from me and I will remember them no longer. Then he adds a second verse. Though your sins be as scarlet... I will wash them whiter than snow. Think of that imagery. Even in Revelation, when John goes to heaven and sees it, and all the people without number, you can't number them, there's too many, praising God, and the angel asks John in heaven, who are all these people? And John says, well, only you know, Lord. 
And the angel said, these are those who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, who were once soiled and filthy, but have now been made clean. Remember, they're all in white, sparkling white robes, praising God. <coughs> these are those who decided to listen to the word of God, return to me, and I will return to you. And as far as the east is from the west, so shall your sins be from me. If your robes are as scarlet, I will make them white as snow. And God held true to his promise. John's just not saying this because it's nice, calming, good rhetoric. He's saying it because he's seen it. Do you understand? Okay, let's take all of that nonsense in the mind of man and bring it to the Seder table. Right in the middle of this holy meal. Remember what Passover was. This is where they worship God because God brought them out of the bondage of Egypt. Uh, saved them from the Egyptians. Brought them into the promised land. The whole nine yards. The promise that I will redeem you at any cost. And Jesus interrupts that holy and sacred meal for thousands of years. Think about it for a moment. America is what, 248 years old? And look at what we've gone through in 248 years. Israel was thousands of years old. And they've been doing that Seder meal, well, from 1450 BC, put it that way. And here we are, roughly 30, BC, 30 AD, with Jesus as an adult. And he takes the holy and sacredest meal by way of the fact that people were saved by the promise of God, gets up in the middle of it and starts washing feet. That was blasphemy. Or was it something bigger is here? They went up on the transfiguration. Moses showed up, the giver of the law. Elijah showed up, the defender of the law, the vengeance of God. And Jesus was in the middle and they said, Lord, these are the two greatest guys in our history. Should we build for them a temple here? And immediately God overclouded them <laughs> and said, this is Jesus, my son. Listen to him alone. Maybe something bigger is here than Moses or Elijah. Maybe something is bigger here than just a holy, sacred ritual of eating herbs and drinking wine. And finally, Jesus spoke to the Pharisees. They said, give us a sign. He said, if you had eyes, you could see. And you would know that the biggest thing you ever, ever will see on this planet is right here in front of you. But you can't see it. Why can't you see that? Well, because oh, if, you, if God only knew all the stuff I've done. <coughs> well, first, <laughs> He does. He does. Every single thing. Every word uttered. Every ugly thought thought. Thought, word, and deed. But if you return to him, he will remember him no longer. If you wash your robe, regardless of the fact that it's scarlet, it shall be made white as snow, and you shall not only be welcomed into the kingdom of your father, you will join that great throng, praising and worshiping and reigning with him forever and ever. John doesn't write this in terms of wishful thinking. He writes it in terms of, this is fact. I've seen it. Now, with that kind of fear in mind, and even greater fear in the sense that the apostles can feel something's about to happen, but they're not sure what. Let's look at chapter 14. Amazing thing about this chapter, it starts and it ends in very much the same way. And it's probably the second greatest message that God gives to the earth throughout the entire Bible. 
Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid. Don't be afraid of God. You believe in God, believe also in me, says Jesus. For in my Father's kingdom are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would not have told you. And I go to prepare a place for each of you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may also be. And you know the way where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. And we do not know the way. Jesus said to him, Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you had known me, you would know the Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. And then the stupidest line in all of Scripture. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. You've just seen the Father on his hands and knees washing your feet. Now don't tell me there's nothing that you got that he can't wash away. God, the Father Almighty on his hands and knees washing your feet. Tell me again how bad your sins are and that God is unaware of them. Sensing the frustration, Jesus says, Have I been with you for so long, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show me the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I have taught you, I do not speak of my own initiative, but the Father abiding within me does his work. Believe me, I am in the Father and the Father in me. Otherwise, believe on account of the miracles themselves. Have you ever seen anybody else do what I've done? Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me and the works that I do, he shall also do. And greater works than these shall you do because I return to the Father. In other words, you're going to do the same stuff even longer and in greater range. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you still another of himself, the helper. And he will remain with you forever. That is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not behold him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I shall come to you. And after a little while, the world will behold me no longer. But you will behold me because I live. You shall also live. In that day, you shall know that I am, in fact, in the Father. And you in me, and now I in you. For he who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. If anyone comes to me, I will no way cast out. Anyone returns to me, says the Father, I will return to him, and their sins shall be no longer even applicable. Now Judas, not the Iscariot, there's actually two Judases, said to him, Lord, 
What then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus in answer and said to him, a little more frustration here. Boys, did you not just hear every word I've said? If anyone loves me and will keep my word, my Father will love him, and we will come to you and make our abode, make our temple within him. And he who does not love me will not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all these things, and most importantly, bring to your memory and remembrance all that I have taught you. My peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Therefore, let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid, for you have loved me, and you would have rejoiced because I do go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you all these things before they come to pass, that when they come to pass, you will believe. You see, the problem here is John has seen all these things. He knows they're true. But these guys do not. I will not speak any longer with you, for the ruler of the world is coming. In other words, Judas and his boys, hatred, Everything ugly about mankind is coming, and he has nothing to do with me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father has given me commandment, so shall I do. Arise, let us go from here. You see the power of that verse when you think to yourself, John knows this will happen. John knows it because John's seen it. Nobody else understands that. This Bible, his gospel, something's wrong with it. There's a reason 97% of John's gospel does not coincide with the other three. The other three wrote from what they experienced in Christ, correct? John wrote from what he experienced in heaven. That's why it's so much fuller, so much richer, so much more to talk about than just what Jesus did down here. Oh, he references those works to be sure. And he even used a couple of the miracles himself. Not like Matthew. Not like Luke. But he uses a couple to stay on task. But his task is shake, shake, shake your collars there. Something bigger is here than just feeding a few people with some fish. Something is bigger here than just this holy, sacred ritual you've been going through for 3,000 years. Something is bigger standing right in front of you, but you cannot see and you cannot hear. Why? Have you got such a low self-esteem, a slow account of yourself that even when God stands in front of you and says, come to me, you're unable to see it? Do you not know how important you are to the, to the Lord? And what I've done with you, you will do with the rest of the world. And for a lot longer time, I got to go back to the Father. I've been here teaching for three years. You guys got your whole life ahead of you. I think Jesus might have smiled at John at that point. Knowing full well John would be the last to go. We're still not sure where or when or how he died. Just an old guy laid down one day. And that was it. The one apostle we know nothing about and yet we know the most about is John. We know most about him from his trip to heaven. We know the least about him of the rest of his work here on earth. That's crazy. But nevertheless, John did his job. So would all these men. They just don't realize it yet. As evidenced by the fact 
Judas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. Or Thomas says. And Jesus said, I am the way to the Father. I'm trying to make it as easy as possible for you. I'm trying to tell you your sins of the past are just that, sins of the past. Like the woman caught in adultery. What did Jesus say to her? Sin. No. No. What did he say first? No. no. Where are those who would hold you accountable for your sins? No. They're not here. Neither is the Lord going to hold you accountable if you return to him. Then what did he say to her? Go and sin no more. Clean it up. Act differently because you are different now. As far as the east is from the west, I don't know how far that is, but I'm going to say a good long way. So shall your iniquities be from me, said the Lord, and I will remember them no longer. Oh, if God only knew the stuff Cheddar's done. <laughs> he does. See, that's one of the true gifts of Christianity is knowing that those infractions are no longer over your head, as Paul said. Anyone who believes in Christ has died to everything that has passed. All things have passed. All things. Not just some things. All things have passed. All things have been made new. This was Paul's understanding of this whole Jesus event. All things have passed. All things have made new. Who are these people? John jumping around in their white suits. Well, the correct answer is those were the ugliest, nastiest, meanest, uh, rudest, obscenest, pervertedest, twistedest people on the planet who finally got an eye open enough to see the opportunity in God and Christ and took it, accepted it. These are the ones who've come through the tribulation. What's the tribulation? Earth! <laughs> who've come through the tribulation and have washed their robes just as God promised, white as snow in the blood of the Lamb. Thomas, Father, we don't know the way. Show us the way. I am the way. That once invisible, intangible, horrifically powerful God that you didn't know I meant. But Lord, you were just on your hands and feet washing my feet. Yeah, I was. Can you not do the same? I am the way, Thomas. I am the way. And that's the truth. Why would John write that? Who are these people, John, that Jumping around. I don't know, Lord. I'll bet you do. That was his answer, remember? He said, these are the ones who have come through the tribulation and have washed their robes just as God promised. Pretty powerful stuff for an unknown, intangible, unrealizable God of the Old Testament. But he promised the same thing Jesus did. Jesus just took it one step further and said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And if you can't believe that we are the same, then believe, for God's sake, believe in the works themselves. Anybody else ever do this stuff? There's a reason for that, you know. There's a reason why Jesus raised, literally raised people from the dead. But Lord, he's been dead four days. Move the rock. Watch this. You know, the only one kicking back is John. He's back there. This is good. <laughs> I saw this stuff in heaven already, but this is going to be good. And 
Lazarus came out. Oh, still bandaged, we're told. Could you imagine that? The mummy movies. He was probably doing that. Going, Where am I, guys? You know, being dead four days takes its toll on you. Somebody get this toilet paper off of me. There is no hopeless case in God. It doesn't exist. There is no barrier or border that can prevent the power and the purpose of His resurrection. Even God says it in the Revelation. My word will not go forth from my mouth. He says it in Isaiah 55. My word will not go forth from my mouth and return to me until what? It accomplishes the purpose for which I sent it. Then it will come back to me. And then we get the beautiful things about, and on that day, you shall be led forth in perfect peace. Shouldn't have been afraid. But we were. Well, that's 365 times in the Bible God tells us don't be afraid. How did this chapter start? Don't be afraid. How did this chapter end? Don't be afraid. All this stuff is true. There is no hopeless case in the eyes of God. There is no hopeless case in the heart of God. And there sure as heaven are no hopeless cases in the purpose of God. His will, His want cannot be thwarted. Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Lord. Thomas, I am the way. And Judas, come on. We're going to send the Holy Spirit and He will help you remember all this stuff because right now you guys are about as dumb as a bag of hammers. I stole that from Brother Where? How art thou? Right now, you guys are as dumb as a bag of hammers. But the Spirit will come and guide you in truth, guide you in wisdom, and most of all, help you remember everything I've taught you. Because it's true. My peace I give you, my peace I leave with you. Nice, nice Jesus. Right here, all hell's about to hit the fan. Don't sweat it, boys. Don't be afraid. Let not your heart be troubled, and don't be afraid. For the Lord and I are greater than anything you can know. I will not speak much more with you, because the ruler of the world is coming. The enemy is coming. Let's get up and get out of here. Pretty powerful chapter. Oh, we like the little promise thing in the beginning about heaven, don't we? But what we fail to realize is that heaven for us here on this plane, this plane of existence has already begun. First of all, He's removed the fear. Second of all, He's given us the way, the truth, and the life. The promise. Third of all, He's sealed that promise with His own blood. That's why He says, drink this, all of you. It's important. And fourthly, He's established His peace. You don't have to sweat. You don't have to wonder. Wonder about what? You don't have to wonder if it's true. It's true. If it weren't, I would not have told you. Last words God says to John in heaven is what? First and last words, by the way. Write down everything you saw. And do what with it? Take it back to the people. Take it back to them. Help them understand that this isn't a fantasy. This isn't something that might happen. It's something that's already happening now. Write this down, John, for what you've seen. My words are faithful and they are true. There's no ands, ifs, or buts about it. You've seen it with your own eyes. You've seen the people saved. You've seen the people rejoicing. You've seen the Lamb slain. You've seen the sins forgiven. And you've seen the glory of all of heaven that is already prepared for you. If I could go back, I'd like to hang with John. 
I'd like to watch John just every time Jesus was doing something and seeing something. I'd like to hang with John after Jesus left. He had some kind of assurance going on that nobody else had. Who can write a chapter this assuring? Let not your heart be troubled. Twice he said that. He opened the chapter and closed the chapter. Why are you still afraid of God? Oh, if God only knew all the stuff I've done. He knows he just doesn't care. If you care for him, he will not care about any of that. He'd rather see you bright and happy on your way and going through life assured of everything. Because you, you know what? You and God, you make a majority in every situation. Period. All right? Chapter 14, full of promise. Full of disappointment. Philip, Thomas, Judas. Really, guys? Well, they were playing with a little... John had a little bit more info than they had. But John's giving it to the world now in his gospel. Doesn't surprise me that 97% of John is unique to itself because 97% of everybody else hadn't seen what John's seen. I majored in John. That was my whole PhD. It was the book of John in interpretation, getting my doctorate. And I did that because I noticed something was different about John. Very different. Something very different about that Seder Mount dinner. Right in the middle of the holiest event in the Jewish mind, Jesus got on his hands and knees and washed my feet. And then got a little frustrated with the boys when they said, show us the Father. I just did. How is it you missed it? I just did. Well, it's just that we master in stupid rather than trying to see what's actually in front of us washing our feet. So, all right, that's 14. 15 gets even better. We're going to have a little fun with 15. All right, see you next week.